Bless him. Give him glory. Y'all, y'all know I want to hear you worship him. He's worthy. I, I, don't get me started. I jump on y'all. My God is good. He's a good God. He's a wonderful Savior. The things that he has done in my life, I cannot tell it all. I cannot tell it all. Even, even me having the opportunity to stand here in front of y'all, I count it not robbery to give him praise, to give him honor, to recognize that I'm only here because of him. My Bible says um, the steps of a righteous man are ordered by God. And because of the salvation of Jesus Christ, that qualifies me as a righteous man. Amen. So I'm here by ordination. I'm here by the order of God. I'm here by by charge. I have a responsibility and I'm going to I'm going to hold up to it as much as I possibly can. Amen. Um, Now, y'all understand that I'm. I'm very much um, a flawed human. I make mistakes. I say things wrong. I do things wrong. But God's grace is sufficient. Amen. Amen. So if I, if I should happen to stumble over my words, I know I'm not, I don't have a tailor-made ministry like the Fountain of Life is used to. Minister Taylor, Minister Jackie, uh, Pastor Jackie Taylor, Pastor Larry Taylor, tailor-made ministry. Y'all get it? Okay, I'm, I'm just trying to make sure y'all with me. All right. Um, but but what God gives me, he gives me because he's, he's created me. He's reared me up to see things in the manner that he intends for me to see them. Not everybody's going to understand what I understand. My responsibility is to is to relay to you what he has shown me. All right. So if it doesn't make sense to you right now, all I want to do is ask you to just go back and study your word. And if I say anything that's outside of the will of God, you have every opportunity. You have my permission to come to me and say, brother, you might have missed that one. I'm not above that. Amen. All right. So I just want to make sure you all understand that. So when you're listening to this, listen to this with the understanding that first God's word is, is, is the main thing you're looking for. Make sure there's truth in it. Anytime you listen unto somebody or somebody brings a word before you, make sure it's inside of the word. And if it is not. Go back and tell them. That's what the church is supposed to do. Do it in love. Let them know that it ain't quite right. And then if they have any sense, they have the the, the love of Jesus in them, they'll go back and they'll fix it. Bless God. All right. So I just want to make sure you all know that's where I stand. That's exactly what I'll do. If you if you hear me, see me do anything in, in here or out there in the city, say so. All right. I'm expecting you to. I can't get right if I don't know I'm wrong. Amen. All right. So um, I was trying to shake the jitters off of me, talking a little bit, try to try to loosen up a little bit. But um, I'm I'm where I'm supposed to be. I know that I got a good word for you all. Um, My 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 message is coming from some of the things that I've seen um, more more recently. They seem to have gotten a lot more bold. Um, there's a lot more of it happening. Um, but God showed it to me some 20 years ago. OK, he showed me basically that it was it was coming to a head. <clears throat> and now that I'm looking at the state of the world that we're in, the things that are going on in the world, the way that people look at the church, look at salvation, look at God, look at a relationship with God. They, they're completely confused in whose, which side is the right side. This was the, the trick of the enemy. This is what the enemy wanted. He wanted confusion. If you don't know which way is right, you'll choose the wrong way, thinking that you're choosing right. Unfortunately, you'll find out it'll be a little too late. Right? So what we want to do is make sure that that's not the case for us. Now, as the church... We need to make sure that we understand our responsibilities to make sure that we 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 do everything in our ability to tell the whole world about the goodness of God. OK, um, and you have to stand firm on God's word. Now, my question to you is this. If you know that God is good, we all know that, right? Everybody in here in agreement. God is amazing. He does great things, wonders to perform. And we, we believe that whatever happens in our lives, we can trust that God is going to see us through it. Right. We agree? Right. So my question is this. 
If you are given an opportunity to witness the goodness of God in your life. Paul, Paul talks about a conversation. When Paul says a conversation, he's not talking about the words that you speak. When we say conversation, we're talking about my wife and I sitting down and talking about a vacation we plan on taking in a couple, you know, couple months, what have you. Right. Me and Pastor Taylor sitting down and talking about the ministry, what have you. But when Paul talks about a conversation, he's talking about lifestyle. Now, the question of your lifestyle is what are you doing that when people see you, it shows God in your life. Right. So if it, if it comes down to you being questioned as to whether or not you believe God enough that you will stake everything in your life on that belief. Is your life worth it? Is your life worth it? We all come. We can come to church and we can say we love God and we, we bless God for all the things that he has done. We, we thank God for who he is and for everything that he's given us. And, and the natural things are easy to, to recognize God for. But if nothing is given to us, if nothing is made available to us and we have to live sim- simply on the things that we have available to us. And people want to tear down our faith because we don't have the natural things, the, the, the tangible things, the car, the house, the money. If we don't have that stuff, is God still good? Is he still worth your life? Would you be willing to die for that? It, it, takes, a real, a, it takes a real faith to say yes. And if you have to stop and think about it, that's actually not a bad thing. Right. To say I love God and I believe God and I, I trust God in everything that I do. It, it's easy when there's nothing happening. Everything is clear. The bills are paid. The kids are good. The job is good. The car still works. When I got in it, it started up. I got to work, got back with the heat on. Thank God for the heat in the car. Glory to God. But if 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 nothing is going right and people come to you and they say, you know what, if you want your stuff to work right. You have a, you have an option. You want a better life. You have an option. You want things to, to be right for your family. You have an option. You can con- you can continue stressing yourself out over what you're doing. Or you can allow me to fix it for you. I'm talking about the world. Amen. We can fix it for you, but it might cost you your life. It might cost you your life. That's a hard truth. Because believe it or not, the world is coming to that. They, they really are. And, it's, it, and, and I know that this is going to be hard for people to take on. A lot of people would rather just believe. They'd rather watch TikTok yeah. than, than to recognize that what's going on in the news. Fake news or not, it's still news. It's still happening, whether it's fabricated or it's actually happening. The world is still in turmoil. So I want to talk to you about two particular people. One of them is actually three people, but the reference to the three is that they are all in one mind. Unity, right? The other person is someone that had been brought up um, to a position that, that basically gave him the opportunity to, to stand on the word of God with everything that was in him. The last one I'm, I'm going to give you, actually, I guess I could say it's three, but it's really just just. To, to point back to our Savior. I want you to know that everything that we're talking about, if I'm ministering, if I get a chance to get back up here, every time I come up here, I'll give you my message, but I'll always go back to Jesus. Because everything that we learn, everything we come to know is always going to come back to Christ. Amen. So it's, it's, it's not worth it to do any of it if Jesus is not in it. OK, the, the answers that you need. The, the, the rewards you're looking for, the, the protection that you want is always going to be in the name of Christ. Yes. Yes. All right. So in this teaching, I want to show you this. Um, and the funny thing is, we're, we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about the Hebrew boys, um, Hananiah, Azariah and Mishael. Y'all, y'all know them better as Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Right. If you know the flip, the flip Wilson translation, Shadrach, Meshach and a big yell. All right, then. Y'all with me. All right. Um, and then we're going to talk about Stephen, Deacon Stephen. All right. And I'm going to tell you, the whole time I was studying on Stephen and getting ready for this message, I, I couldn't help but thinking about our own, our own uh, deacon. Um, this brother is a lot like you. Amen. Put forth every effort to make sure that everything is where it's supposed to be. Amen. All right. 
So, um, but if you'll, if, you'll, if you'll come with me to the book of Joshua 24. Amen. While y'all are turning your pages, I just want to thank God for the opportunity to stand before y'all and deliver his word. And I ask that right now he take over. Um, less of me and more of thee, O God. Um, have your way in this place. Have your way in the hearts of these that hear your word. And Lord God, speak to us in the place, in the place of our need. Let it be so right now in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Are we there? Okay. Joshua twenty four fifteen reads like this. Joshua says, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your an- whether the gods your ancestors served in the, re- in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Amen. All right. Now, um, I'll come back to that. God has this impeccable tendency to set us up to give him to give us to give us the opportunity to give him glory. He'll always push us in the direction to do something or to be before somebody where the the question as to whether or not we really believe God is going to be presented. And again, the question is whether or not you will believe that all the way up until the last breath. Right. So the Hebrew boys, I want to go ahead and jump into this because I I'm already talked out about 10 minutes of my time. Um, the quick story, quick backstory about the Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They are, they are Hebrew sons. They are, um, they are actually prophesied sons. If you go back to Ezekiel, uh, I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 39, uh, verse 5, you'll see that, that Isaiah went to Hezekiah and told Hezekiah, you're going to have sons that are going to serve under a Babylonian king, right? And, and at that time, Hezekiah didn't have kids, right? In fact, his first, his, I think his first son, Melchizedek, was not born just yet. Now, I think it was some, some time before that even happened. Um, I don't have the exact time frame. Don't, don't hurt me for that one. But, hmm? uh-huh. um, so as this, as this is coming about, Basically, about 100 years later, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of, of Babylon, comes in and he takes over Jerusalem. Um, if you go to Daniel chapter one, Daniel chapter one, verse one, I'll go ahead and start reading for you. In the third year of the reign of Jeho- Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, into Jerusalem and besieged it. Right. He sees obviously means he came in and he took it over. This was not an uncom- uncommon thing. Whenever you're looking at Israel, you look at the, the, the history of Israel. Israel was always being jumped on by somebody. Somebody was always trying to take over Israel. And what it was was they, they recognized the God of Israel. They figured if they can control the land, then the God would actually show them favor as well. Somehow there was supposed to be a connection. All they ended up doing was putting themselves in a position to get stomped out. Amen. So here, here's Nebuchadnezzar putting himself in this position. He's about to get himself in trouble. So I just wanted to show you that part. Now go over to, to chapter 3. All right, so in the course of chapter 1 and chapter 2, there's a lot of things that had conspired. Um, the Hebrew boys had, had, um, had committed themselves to a fast. At the end of the fast, the fast actually showed them as being in, in God's favor to the point that they actually got promoted to rulers of provinces under Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was trying to get them in a position where he could hold them in his pocket and have them to basically help him to rule the land and help him to, to, to handle the, the, the people, the Israelite people in the land. He wanted to basically be able to have his hand in everybody's lifestyle at that place, at that place in time. All right. But what he, he didn't understand was that he was dealing with someone that was fully committed to God. Amen. Right. They, they had been in fellowship with Daniel, the prophet Daniel. If you know anything about Daniel, Daniel ain't no joke either. Right. But these Hebrew boys, what they wanted to do, they wanted to make sure that whatever they did, they did it in the will of God. They did it to the glory of God. So here we are um, in chapter three. Nebuchadnezzar has it in his mind because he's received a prophecy about a, a, a golden statue, something that, that basically he, he, he believed to be about him, to something that would reverence his, his prominence, his, his kingliness. Right. So he builds this statue. This, this immaculate statue, golden statue, and he puts out a decree. He tells the people, he says, 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play some music. When I play the music, I'm expecting everybody to stop what they're doing. I'm expecting everybody to, to worship this, this idol. And if you don't do it, then it's going to cost you. Everybody's going to find themselves in the fiery furnace. Now, I'm, I'm summing this all up. I'm just, I'm just kind of giving you a, a quick run through. I'm not giving you the exact details. You guys go back and study it for yourself. All right. But this is pretty much what he told the people. Now, this would include everybody. Now, the actual decree was for everybody that was in a position of rulership. Any, anybody in a position of leadership. Now, I just told you the Hebrew boys had just been promoted to rulers over provinces under his king, king, kinghood, kingship. Right. So that means that they are expected to be just like the rest of them. So here comes a time where the music actually gets played. And the king is sitting up there and he's looking over the land and he's got this actual group of um, advisors, the Chaldeans. Now, the Chaldeans are their responsibility, apparently, at this particular point in this time is to watch and see what happens in the land. So as the king is, 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 is reverencing and, 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 and lavishing in all of this glory and, and whatnot to his idol, the Chaldeans are watching everybody else. And they happen to notice that the Hebrew boys didn't bow down. Right. So they go, they, they lean over to the king and say, you know what? The fellas over there ain't, ain't quite doing what you said do. Right. It's caused the king to feel some kind of way. So he calls them over and he says, you guys tell me what's actually happening. Do you really not? Are you not going to honor this? Do you not understand that I, I said that if you don't do it, it's going to cost you your lives. Now, this is the part I actually want you guys to hear. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Go to verse 16, chapter 3, verse 16. I'm, I'm going to tell you, this, this here, it, it, the, way that it, the way that it was said, the way that it was presented to me, it made me feel like I have an obligation to live my life like this. I really do. I have an obligation to live my life, life like this. And unfortunately, I have points in time where I'm dealing with people on my job and I try to stand like this and it's not even necessary. I'm just being bigger than I have to be. You'll see what I'm talking about. So in verse 16, it says here, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego answered. This is after King asked him if you guys are, are and you're not worried about what what the decree is. You're not even worried about the consequences are. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from this burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of, this, out of thine hand, O king. Watch this next verse. These next three words are the words that inspire me the most. But if not. If he don't do it, he's still God. I, I don't, it don't, it don't, my life is irrelevant. He gets the glory. So if, if you're going to throw me in there, then throw me in there. But I'm, I'm going in there glorifying God. You understand what I'm saying? I'm going in glorifying God. It doesn't matter what you say about it. I understand you gave me. Look, watch, go back here. Um... I want, I want you all to see it with your own eyes. And they answered, this is verse 16, and they answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, the fact that they said his name directly to him means they knew exactly who they were talking to. I know you're the king. I know you're my boss. I know you got money. I know that people know you and they, they respect you and all of that, but I'm not concerned about all of that. The God that I serve is greater than that. So if I don't give him my life, what would be my answer at the end of it all? I can't answer for it after the fact. So while I'm here in the fire, I might as well let him see that I meant what I said. You understand what I'm saying? So this, this, is, this is where I want to make sure we all understand it. If you say you love him, if you say you glorify him, and you lay down your, I give myself away so you can use me. What if he chooses to use you to give him glory? What if he wants your last breath? Does he deserve it? Does he deserve it? So, of course, that, that cost him. You, most of us have heard this story before, so we know what the end result of that is. 
Nebuchadnezzar feels some kind of way, feelings done got hurt, whatnot. He's embarrassed in front of everybody else. So of course, he has to throw them into the furnace. Seven times hotter than it has to be, right? And of course, he ends up witnessing the fact that our Savior ends up being there with them. Y'all with me? He's not, he's not going to let you go through something like that and not be there to, to at least to stand with you. Okay? So I just want to make sure we see that. When you go back and you study your word, check, start noticing the little things that God does. Right? Look at the negative stuff. If it's written in there, the negative stuff, the stuff that works against us, see what it, did, what it, what it is and where it came from. There's usually an origin for the negative stuff that happens in the Bible. Something somebody said, something somebody did, and it actually manifested to the point that it put us in the place where we now have to look back and say, God, how did I get here? But if you are, if you are truly a believer in the word of God, trust the, the spirit of God to lead you and to guide you then there's nothing for you to be worried about. Even if you end up in the furnace, God, if I, if I die here, to be absent from the body is what? You got to understand that. You have to understand that. You have to recognize that, that he's going to make a way that either way you're going to see his glory. You're going to recognize that he has been in the midst of it in, in either case. I'm going to show you what I mean. Let's go to Acts 6. Is it just me or is it toasty in here? It might be me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but before, before we go into the next verse, y'all stay your, page, stay your page, just stay where you are. Um, Acts 6. Um, I want to go back and I want to point out these again. Um, like I said, but if not, those, those three words mean a lot to me because what they said is everything that we needed to hear about, about being steadfast and unmovable. That's what that means. That means don't, don't, don't be shaken. Don't be bent. Don't, you, the, the reed can bend, but it, it shall, shall not break. It's not supposed to break. You're not supposed to give up. It doesn't matter how much they hit you, the flogging, the, 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 the lashes, the... the, the the, the words, the things they say, the way they make you feel, it's not enough. It's not enough. It's not enough to give up. Stand on God. Trust him. It, it, it'll rain this evening. It'll rain tonight, but sure enough, it'll, it'll be better in the morning. It will. You're going to wake up one day, and it'll, it'll be like, I can't believe I made it through it. I thought that was it for me. So like I said, the boys, they decided they would rather die than, than to, to honor this false god. They would, now, this is what I need to do. I need to, y'all, we're going to get to, to uh, Acts 6, but I want to go back to um, Exodus 20 real quick because I want to point to this for you. I apologize for that. Exodus 20, y'all already know what this is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sure enough. All right, starting at verse 3, Exodus 20, verse 3. Y'all know, it, y'all know where we are. Amen? In the, in the commandments, verse 3, the first, the first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. That means that when people try to put stuff in front of your face, it has nothing, no, no weight against the God that we serve. Okay? So I, I want to make sure we're, we're here because when I go to Stephen, I'm going to show you again. Verse 4. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. And bro just made the, the idol, didn't he? Okay. That means that we can't, we can't be okay with what he's done. We can't honor what he has done. We have to make sure that we are okay in our lives. So if it's not, it's not, it's, it's not good for us, there's no point for us to, to do that. We have to answer for that. I did it because they said do it. Mm-hmm. Well, that's going to cost you. Verse 5, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, which was the decree of Nebuchadnezzar, nor serve, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a what? I am a jealous God. So here's your reason. This is why it's important that you don't allow yourself to submit 
to the, to the influences of any other God. There are people that serve other gods that believe they're serving the right God and it's going to cost. Right. If you don't understand what your instructions are, you'll follow right behind them. And unfortunately, God, I'm sorry. I'm I'm, going to pick up my wife real quick. When 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 I tell my wife to do something, correction, when I ask my wife to do something, right. (laughs) And she chooses to do contrary. Right. I have to go back and I have to say, okay, baby, I I, I know I made I, I know I made it clear as best I could what we need to do. And unfortunately, what you're doing means I have to go back and I have to do it twice now. And she understands that I'm actually upset about it. And she'll go, I'm sorry. Now, I melt on the inside. I, 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 I love you too much to be mad after that. I want to be. But it, it, once you say that, OK, uh, well, I'll just fix it. But you don't get to do that after this life is over. There's no salvation, and I'm sorry. There's no redemption, and I'm sorry. You can't take it back. There's no reset button. Cameron, I don't know if you remember the, the old Nintendo, the NES. You remember it? Okay, I guess you're older than I thought. But the old, the old Nintendo, the first Nintendo, had a, had a button right next to the power button, the reset button. And you get into playing the game, and when you, when you got to that last life, and that last life was gone... Instead of going back and starting the game all over again, you go over and you hit that button. I'm not starting over again. I'm not, I'm not losing again. And then you, you get yourself back to the place where you're supposed to be at. And then when it, you lose that life again, you go back and you hit it again. Reset. Reset. You don't get to reset this life. You don't get to start over. Once you make a mistake, you have to basically start from the mistake and just do your best from that point on. Right? All right. So when, when it comes down to these, these decisions... Um, who you're dealing with, how you're dealing with them, what they expect of you, so on and so forth. Check with God first. Y'all know that. Check with God first. Find out what he's expecting from you about that matter. If you've never faced that situation before, it's in the word. Every situation that we we as human beings experience in our lives, it's in the word. It might not say it for that word exactly, but somewhere in there, there is something that's connected to that situation and the answer that you're looking for is in that word. You just got to find it. And I, I promise you, the best thing to do is to find whatever that is, because if you don't, you don't get to say, I'm sorry. He gave you all the answers are here. I gave you the answers to the test. So don't don't come back and say, I didn't know. If you didn't take the time to study it, that's on you. Study to show that self approved. Amen. All right. Let's let's get to my deacon. Acts 6, uh, verse 1, and in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the, of the uh, Grecian against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily mainstream. Now, I'm, I'm going to stop there. I don't want to read the whole thing. I'm running out of time. I'm going to give you a quick run through. So the disciples, the ones that were being trained by, by Christ, right? Christ has, has ascended. The disciples have put their hand to the plow. They're now doing what they have been trained to do. Right. And they are they are in Greece. They're dealing with the Grecian people. And the. The the problem is that the disciples being only 12 don't have the ability to serve everybody. So they realize that they're going to need work. They're going to need help to do the work. Right. So they, they get together and they realize they say, well, let's let's do this. Let's bring in some people to help us get this done. Right. And this is the introduction of the first deacons. Right. Now, um, the Bible says that there were seven that were chosen. Right. The only one we're going to talk about is Stephen. Right. Now, Stephen, he, he makes he makes this this impression immediately. Um. Verse five says, (laughs) 
Give me a second. Take your time, brother. So, Stephen is, is, is recognized as being full of favor. He's, he's got this ability to do basically everything that the disciples were doing. The apostles now, they are apostles. Everything that they were able to do, Stephen actually had the ability to do. He could minister to people. He could lay hands on people. He could, he could deliver the gospel to them. He could tell them everything that they needed to know to be delivered into a right standing with God. Right? And this was what they were looking for. Right? This is what they, want, what they wanted. It says here in um, verse 3, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among ye seven men of honest rapport, full of the Holy Ghost, the wisdom whom we may appoint over the business. But we will give ourselves continually out over to prayer to the ministry of, of the word. Right. So these guys have got to be able to do the work that we are doing so that we can go and do something else. Right. Stephen was one of those that was chosen. The thing about Stephen was that Stephen was actually really good at what he did. And there, were, there was a group of people, the, I'm not sure why I'm not able to find this. Yeah. Yeah, let's start there. Verse eight. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders, and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, the Cyrenians, and the Alexandrians, and of, and of them of Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. Okay, thank you. So the problem was that Stephen was doing his job. That's all he was doing, what he had been brought up to do. And there were people that came in having an issue with what he was doing. That's all this was. Stephen was, was elevated to deacon to serve the people, to serve the widows, to serve the mothers, <coughs> excuse me, to make sure that everybody had what they needed. They were getting the service that they needed so that they could learn what this word was about, this lifestyle was about, right? And these other folks, they, they, they weren't being given the opportunity to be seen as being equal for, for the most part, and they had an issue with Stephen. Now, if you all recall, there's somebody else that had this similar situation. While Jesus was ministering, blessing the whole of, of everybody that came, to, came before him. The Sanhedrin comes in and they're like, well, you're, you're doing too much. This is where it falls apart for Stephen. Because all I did was come in and do what they called me to do. And you guys are all in my face about all this crazy stuff. To the point that Stephen says, you know what? All I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you that God is good. And what he does is he starts to tell them the history yeah. of creation, right. the history of the Israelite people, the history of the faith, all the way up until he starts talking junk to them. He says, you guys, you're stiff-necked people. Everything that we're doing, you're invited to be a part of just as much as we are. But instead of being a part of it, you want to have a problem with me simply because I'm doing the will of my father. Yeah. Stephen wasn't raised up or wasn't trained up with the disciples. He didn't see Jesus face to face like that. He he actually had an opportunity to be raised up by the be trained up by the disciples. Now, as it goes forward. Stephen is 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 pretty much fed up with what he's being, being treated for, how he's being treated. It's, it's not something that he has to sit, sit up there and, and make explanation for. He's not trying to make explanation. Instead, he talks about God. And it bothers the people so much that they decide to stone him. Now, we know Stephen as the first martyr. We know that that's what it costed him. But again, my question is, would you be willing to give up your life? He didn't do anything in, in, in particular. He didn't do anything special. He just did what, what the Lord gave him the ability to do. And people didn't agree with it. Now, I want you to look at his famous last words. This, this, is, what I, this is what my message was generally about. It was about each, each of these people's last words. Like I said, but if not, was what the Hebrew boys would say. 
I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to turn my back on God. I'm not going to do anything contrary to what God has already told me to do. I'm going to believe that he's going to stand with me. But if he doesn't, all well and good. Stephen decides to tell them about God himself. That's what he decides to do. Right. The whole of, of chapter seven talks about how Stephen tells them about the history and who how God created everything and why he, he moved everybody, how we all ended up where we are. He told him about Abraham and he told him about. So let's go. Let's talk about where Joseph gets where he's, he's being stoned to death. And he stops and he says, I see the heavens opened up. And the son of man standing on the right hand of God. Now, you have to ask yourself, if I'm if I'm being stoned to death and I, I know that it's going to be I'm eventually going to breathe my last breath. How immaculate could it possibly be that while you while you're being beaten to death, you look up and you recognize the presence of God in the atmosphere? How amazing can that be? Your life doesn't matter at that point. Right now, you see God. And if you, if you go out like that, then so be it. But I'm going to see God. And I'm seeing him right now as y'all are thinking y'all are having the way in my life. But God has put me here for the sole purpose of making sure that I glorify him first. And in glorifying him, you guys trying to take me out of here. All you're going to do is prove that I was right. That's all you're going to do. Then he says here. Now. Pastor Taylor mentioned this. I think it was Sunday. He says when when Christ was on the cross, he managed to utter. Forgive them, father, for they know not what they do. Right. This is this is a reason why Stephen becomes one of my favorites, because Stephen says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. I'm dying. I know that one of these stones is going to end it for me. But in the midst of my being put to this place, I'm having compassion on the ones that are putting their hands on me. When you're in that situation, somebody says something that's, that's outside of what you want them to say about you, makes you feel some kind of way. The first thing you want to do is to say, "Uh, uh-uh, uh, you ain't about to treat me like this. Let me go ahead and tell you about yourself real quick. Give them an earful of what you think about them, and then storm out of the room like you did something. Right? That that, that would make us feel better. It will make us feel like we did something. We accomplished something. Yeah, you thought you had me, but I made you feel about this big. How about that? But now you got to go back and you have to uh, repent for it because you mistreated this child. They're not your friend, but they're still his child. That's your responsibility. Stephen is sitting here and he's going, I still believe you, God. I still trust you, God. I still live my life for you, God. And I know that you wouldn't want me to say anything about them that's contrary to your love for them. So I'm going to say this these last few minutes and I want to make sure we understand it. The life that Christ lived was similar to these two lives and we know that. We know that he was he was constantly under under scrutiny. He was tried. He was sentenced. He was committed to death. Right. The Hebrew boys were committed to death, but Christ came in to save them out, pull them out. Come on. We know that. And then turned around and he goes through it himself. But when he goes, he goes to, to the fact of or to the point of getting us the opportunity to be delivered out of everything that we suffered. Know who you are. When Christ was was, um, his first attempt and his first trip to Jerusalem for the Passover, his parents forgot about him. They left him and and they started going home. The Bible says they were three days away. And they realized they, they didn't have Christ with them. They had to go back to get him. When they found him in the synagogue, they came up to him. They asked him, well, what's going on with you? How come you wasn't with us? He said, I thought you knew I was about my father's business. Did you not understand that? 
He tells, he tells the disciples in John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah. Christ knew exactly who he was. We, we find that out when, when, he told, when he tells his parents, I'm about my father's business. This is what I'm required to do. This is what I'm expected to do. So it's not something that he was doing contrary to being their son. He was, he was understanding that God was greater than that. Now, that, that's a different kind of, of murder. When you, when you make your parents mad and they decide to put their hands on you, uh, you're just going to have to suffer that one and deal with it, right? And then when you wake up in the morning, you rub it out and you keep on going. That's it. Um, but at some point, you have to draw the line. In Matthew 12, 34, he calls, he calls the Sanhedrin, he calls him the brood of vipers, Right? You're, you're bothering me about all this stuff, but you don't even realize that you're actually in more trouble than you think. This is bad for you. He tells him in, in Matthew five seventeen. he says, I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. He knows exactly who he is, and he draws a line in that. I'm here for a purpose. Amen. At some point, you have to stand your ground. If you could, turn your Bible to uh, Ephesians six thirteen. I got a few more uh, scriptures for you, and then I'll be done. Oh, that's Philippians. Verse 16 says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Now, we've heard that before. Where have we heard that at? Right here. Right? This, this has been the message that's been given to us for, for some time now. Right? Take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand therefore. Mm-hmm. Right. So these things are going to come against you. But understand that when you study this word and you allow this word to get engrafted in your being, then when these things happen, all you got to do is trust in God. And we see with the Hebrew boys, they trusted in God and he showed up and, and he was standing there with them. We saw it with Stephen. When it happened to him, he was being welcomed into the, the, the afterlife. Amen. So there's no reason to not be trusting in everything that God gives us. The whole armor is us being able to trust that God is going to see us through. That's what it is. If if you had to put it in one line, I trust fully that God will see me through this. Every word that he says, everything that he gives me, everything that he showed me, I'm I'm going to trust in his word with the sword. I'm going to trust in the shield. I'm going to trust in the breastplate. I'm going to trust in the helmet. He gave them to me for a reason. Yes. Yes. Praise God. So, stand your ground. There's no reason to, to run from, from opposition. It's going to come. They hated you. No, remember, they hated me before they hated you. This is what Christ tells us. He says, you will be persecuted for my name's sake. If you're going to do my work, they're going to come after you. This is what's going to happen. There, there are road signs to our, to our walk that, that show that we are going the right direction. And a lot of them are ones that, that don't feel good. I'm, I'm, real, I'm serious. They, they don't feel good. People are going to say things that we don't want to hear them say. They're going to do things we don't want them to do. And they're going to try to look at us like something is wrong with us, but we're actually standing on the right side. Amen? I got less than a minute. Everybody go First Peter 4 and 1. I'm just going to rattle off some scripture for you. I'm going to do like my pastor do. If I could find. What yet? How you say it, pastor? Come to me. First Peter. There you go. All right. And it worked, huh? How about that? First Peter 4. Verse one, for as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. Arm yourselves likewise with the same. I am about my father's business. Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, 
Arm yourselves likewise in the same mind, for he that suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So if, if what we're doing, knowing that it's going to cost us, is not enough for us to be concerned about our lives, then we, we do everything for the glory of God, understanding what God is expecting of, of us. It becomes easier not to sin against God. If you purpose yourself to live for God, it's, it's hard to, to sin against him. I'm going to give you one more. Malachi. 2136. I'm waiting for the music. I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. I, I read that wrong. Malachi 3 and 2. There it is. Verse 2 says, But who may, who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when the when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller soap. There's no way that you can apologize for what you did. There's no coming back from it. You can't you can't say I'm sorry for what, what I what I committed. The best thing for you to do. Mm-mm. the best thing for you to do is to, is to already have it in your mind that you're going to, again, have it in your mind that you're going to live for Christ. Yeah. Period. When, when, the, when the messenger comes, there won't be anything that you could say to make right what you've done. So when the world, when the world comes against you, so I'm, I'm going to say this, because I feel like I, I got to say it and I'm, I'm actually fighting it. Mm, I see it. Um, the state of the world today is pushing us in a direction of submission. There's something that the world is expecting of us that is contrary to God. The reason I wanted to deliver this message, I believe I was supposed to deliver this message, is because God is expecting us to stand against that opposition. The church has always been its intended to do that. To stand and to represent the kingdom. If you choose to submit yourself to the way of the world, it's going to be an issue that you, again, cannot come back from. But you have every opportunity to stand with God. Everybody's been invited. If you, if you understand what I'm trying to say to you, it's going to, it's going to be a place where you have to ask yourself, is it worth my life? Is it worth my life? Is it worth me suffering, them looking at me like something wrong with me? Is it worth them putting me in jail? Is it worth them doing whatever they're going to do? The Antichrist is on the way, is what I'm trying to say. He's, he's working it out right now, and what he wants to do is he wants to make sure that the church will fall under that subjection just as much as everybody else in the world is trying to influence us to do so. Like the Hebrew boys, my, my, I would admonish you to be willing to say, I trust God that he'll bring me out. But if not, so be it. Praise God. That's all I got for you.